Hi, this is Rolo Anjuran and I'm going to go over the basic concepts for someone who wants to start reading the IEC 62368-1 standard 2023 version. So let's get right into it. And the very first concept is what is a safety hazard? So in this case, you have some kind of device, you have an energy source that get transferred onto the body part. So for example, let's say this part is maybe very hot. Put your finger on it, you're going to get burned. Or maybe it might give you an electrical shock. Okay, so these are two types of um, safety hazards. And the IEC standard explains it this way. And by the way, all the um, screenshots here are from uh, the standard. There's an energy source so it could be a very hot product or a product that's moving or maybe something rotating or something like that. And you have a body part that touches, for example, a hot part, let's say. So it's a mechanism of energy transfer onto the body. Okay. And as it as the body touch touches the the hot part, it might get burned. The skin might get burned, for example. Okay. Another concept, and I'm going through several concepts that might seem a bit disjointed, but then you will see how they come together later. So, who's going to use the, con the, the product? Ordinary person, instructed person, or skilled person? This is a very important concept. So, a skilled person is someone who knows very clearly what the hazards are, and also knows very clearly, with significant experience, how to avoid these hazards. Okay, An instructed person is someone that, who has been uh, instructed by a skilled person, and when I mean instructed, is really like trained, not just read uh, a user manual. It's really someone who has got some kind of training or is being supervised by a skilled person. Okay, and an ordinary person is everybody else. So in most cases, this is the key concept. Okay. Operating conditions is another one very important. Normal operating condition is the way the product is supposed to run uh, most of the time okay an abnormal abnormal situation is for example a fan is disabled okay so it cannot cool the product as it's supposed to now the product might overheat but still there might not be any hazard coming out of it and from the point of view of this IEC standard this would be uh, no problem as long as uh, the product overall remains safe Okay, uh, blocking a vent, for example, things like that. And single fault. So, for example, if protective earth is disabled, if there's a short circuit, uh, these are examples of single fault. Also, when it's being stress tested, for example, in a lab, when there's a hyper test or something like this, also this is usually a single fault. So it can be in the lab, uh, it can be out there in the hands of users. And also, we need to look at this. We need to really think about this. The product has a certain intended use. So, for example, a smartphone, well, people are going to use it to make phone calls. They're going to use it to listen, maybe watch a YouTube video. Maybe uh, they're going to they're gonna play a video game. They, they might do a number of things with a smartphone, right? They might use it in their uh, car when driving to, to see where they're going, etc., etc., etc. There might be a lot of things that a, a product is used for. But also, what product designers also don't think of is a reasonably foreseeable misuse. Okay, misuse. Misuse means not good. Okay, and I, I have a few examples here. I just did a little bit of research. So the OSHA is an administration in the US for workplace safety, and they look at avoid how to avoid misuse of extension cords, okay? Uh, and then, for example, they say, well, overloading. If you draw too much power, so yeah, too much current, well, it might overheat, it might short out, right? That That's a problem. That, that can become a safety problem. Or if the cord goes out through a window and then sometimes you open the window, sometimes you close the window, well, after a while, you might break the insulation, Right, that might become very uh, dangerous. Or if you use it outdoor, where it's supposed to be used for indoor uh, applications. Well, all of these are foreseeable, reasonably foreseeable misuse. 
right? So you can't actually totally ignore it. Now we talked about hazards. Now let's talk about the impact of the hazards. There's three levels of impact, and this is a very important concept. Class 1, class 2, class 3. Okay, so class 1, basically not really an issue. Okay, there's not really, no, no, no real danger here. On the body, in terms of injuries, also on uh, materials and maybe starting a fire in a building or in a warehouse or something like that. Class 2, that's painful, okay, but not in injury. Now, uh, not in injury means you don't have to go to a hospital, right? You don't have to go see a doctor. That's what they mean by not in injury. And there might be a bit of a fire, but not a big fire. Okay, and class 3 is what is really, really high severity types of impact. There is injury, you need to, to go to hospital. You might die, actually. It might, this might kill you. This might start a big fire. Okay, and we will come back to this. Now, class 1 energy source. Okay, you need to think about it in terms of the different operating conditions. Okay, this is where the concept starts to, to, to work together. So, when is it class 1? and not class 2, for example. Well, if there's a class 1 energy source uh, that, if there is a single fault condition, results in going to class 3, actually, it is class 2. Okay? This is the kind of complications, of course. Uh, you need to read the standard and fully understand it. I'm just trying to summarize things based on my uh, understanding of ex and experience here. Now, another very important concept is the concept of safeguard. So you have the energy source, transfers to the body, that's a hazard. Now, you put a safe, safeguard in place. For example, a product is very hot. You insulate the product, and this way you protect the body. This is a safeguard to avoid or to mitigate or to uh, make it less likely that there is a hazard and the effect of the hazard, right? Injury, fire, etc. Now, there's three types of safeguards. Okay, reinforced safeguards, or basic and supplemental safeguards. And in some cases, they will say that reinforced safeguard can be replaced by a basic plus supplemental safeguard. Now, let's look at some examples from the standard. So, for, they give us this table, table 3, and there's different kinds of safeguards here, like from best, uh, most effective, to least effective. If you just provide instructions, well, you hope that they will actually read the user manual, right? Uh, if you count on people to wear, for example, personal protective equipment, yeah, you really count on them to do certain things, right? If you count on people to or, or companies to install something, to do something as part of the installation of the product. For example, a TV, the way you, you, you set it up, maybe if it's affixed on a wall, well, there's certain things that need to be done, okay? But the best is when the safeguard is part of the equipment itself. It cannot be removed, it cannot be forgotten, right? Uh, at least it's not expected to be. So this is the best. Now, let's look at reinforced safeguards. So under normal operating conditions, and also if there is single fault, a single fault condition, so for example, a re reinforced insulation, right? It will still uh, be effective. Okay. Now, if you cannot have a reinforced safeguard, well, you might have a basic safeguard, basic insulation, and they do define all these things, right? Basic insulation, what does it mean, and so on. Plus a supplemental, uh, supplementary uh, insulation. Okay, one plus the other. If there is a single fault condition somewhere else, this plus this uh, might be sufficient okay, to replace this. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Again, I'm simplifying. All right. And here they, they give the example. Of course, the basic safeguard is to make sure that the temperatures you know, remain below any kind of dangerous temperature. For example, there's a fan, there's some vents, etc. to keep it cool. But then maybe the fan stops working. Maybe the vents are blocked. So you also need a fire enclosure because if fire starts inside the product, it needs to be contained, right? But if you have an enclosure that uh, melts 
or breaks uh, way too easily when there's a when there's a fire inside this is not going to work you don't have a supplementary safeguard okay talking about safeguards just a little bit more about this so you see for ordinary persons <laughs> uh, you need certain safeguards for instructed persons you typically need less safeguards or let's say weaker safeguards are okay and for skilled persons even less again the, the, the standard goes into this in depth I'm not going to go into this in all the cases let's just take the case of the ordinary person okay I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not covering the, the case of instructed or skilled persons so if it's a class 1 energy source not going to hurt them not going to damage any kind of equipment or facility or anything it's fine you actually don't need a safeguard okay when you start to go into dangerous situations but not deadly not going to send you to hospital not going to start a um, you know not going to be likely to start a big fire let's say you can have a basic safeguard but also in cases where for example someone has to service the device or the equipment and that means the basic safeguard is removed or defeated basically it's not going to be effective you also need instructions and instructions might say do not touch this yourself you need to bring it to a, a repair shop or, or something like this or send send it back to us or it, also it typically says make sure that children do not touch this product right? there's a lot of things going to this and then when you know you have a class 3 energy source potentially deadly or starting a big fire or something like this well then you need a basic safeguard and a supplementary safeguard okay and and it might be okay to have a reinforced safeguard instead of these two make sure to read the standard carefully but I'm just trying to simplify things here okay I keep talking about fire as an example sometimes I mentioned electric shock uh, also mentioned maybe a pot is very hot but there's some other things like also mentioned that for, for example a pot might be rotating or uh, moving well that's mechanical and you also have uh, radiation types of energy and it, they are covered in different sections of the standard okay so it's not all just about fire or uh, electrical safety right uh, p by the way is for power right the other ones are uh, rather obvious and still talking about safeguards and talking about the different kinds of energy one safeguard can be used against several kinds of energy so for example enclosure we okay, think of something like the, the housing of the product the, the case of the product let's say the casing okay casing it might be used as a an electrical safeguard okay against uh, for example uh, electrical shock it can also be used as a fire enclosure against the spread of fire within the enclosure to the outside okay to contain the fire inside the product basically it can also be a mechanical safeguard okay to make sure for example there's some rotating parts to make sure that somebody's hair or clothes don't get caught uh, into these parts and that's it for this uh, training module uh, just a quick disclaimer we're not lawyers we're not uh, compliance consultants make sure you work with competent people always you should not just read these slides right you have to read the standard understand the standard deeply otherwise you need to work with people who do and that's it for this training module i hope it was useful thank you